Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall. What up? And Michael Reed. Hey, how are you guys doing out there tonight? I hope that you guys are doing well, because I am doing fantastic. Was yes. that good, Kyle? <laughs> yes, that is great. I love the upbeat uh, about that. And we're joined by a special guest, Parker Hamlet of the Redskins Brawl. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, brother. Oh, dude, it's an absolute honor, man. Love the Burgundy Zone. Love what you and Mike, you and both Mikes bring to the table, man. Huge fan. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Know, you. Uh, that's such nice things to say, and you didn't, you didn't have to do that, but I appreciate it because uh, you do. You have a lot of hard work. You put a lot into it, and uh, and uh, I give a lot of credit to you because you were very adamant um, in messaging me and getting on here, and that just shows the type of uh, person you are and that you are eager to talk Redskins football, and I'm telling you right now, brother, you're going to fit right in. Because that's all we want to do. And we have a great show lined up for you guys. Uh, we have a bunch of topics to discuss. Um, we have, for a fun little tidbit, we're going to have our three most Redskins moments that are most coverable to us since we've been alive. Since, like, I guess, the early 90s to try to make it harder on everybody. And then we're going to talk about the latest developments with Quentin Dunbar out in Seattle. Doesn't look like he started off too well there. And then we're going to talk about some Dwayne Haskins and Urban Meyer talk. So first off, everybody... Let's get this going. Unfortunate enough, Quentin Dunbar just had an arrest warrant issued for him yesterday. I forget the other cornerback's name that was with him, but it was aggravated robbery. Hall, did you see that? Yeah. So whenever you before we were talking, before we started recording, you brought it up, and I was like, oh, let me look it up really quick. And I typed in QU, and the first thing that pops up is Quentin Dunbar arrested. I was like, oh, man. So, uh, yeah, what was his name? With uh, Baker from the uh, Giants also yeah. got arrested down was in DeAndre Florida. DeAndre Baker and him? Yeah, DeAndre yeah. Baker. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't want to like speculate anything until all the facts come out, but uh, some pretty heavy charges: four counts of a uh, robbery and like four counts of like aggravated assault. Like, it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I forget who the player was. Uh, relatively recently, they got locked up for like moving a whole bunch of dope. Um, Bashar yeah. Breeland. <laughs> I thought I thought he was an idiot. <laughs> you know, like I thought he was an idiot. Like this is this just puts it over the top. Why are you robbing people? You right. know, I guess I guess we thought Earl Thomas. That was like the whole t- tip of the iceberg with weird quarantine stories. Earl, I think they're just getting weirder and weirder. Earl Thomas man. still takes a cake. <laughs> Earl, Earl Thomas still takes a cake. Uh, so now what I'm wondering is. Quentin, so he, this is the first that I heard about it, like literally right when I logged on here and I signed in. He, so he, for armed robbery, aggravated robbery, what was he, what was he doing? Who did he rob? I didn't didn't look into the story. The first thing I saw the headline was TMZ. Why do you, I mean, you already, right, you already (laughs) got the Redskins robbed by the Seahawks with this trade, and (laughs) now you're out robbing people. No, (laughs) that's so funny. That's perfect timing, though. I mean, he was, Dunbar was kind of a pain in the ass over, towards the end of last year and this off season, uh, it's a good thing we got rid of him. This would not have flied. This would not have flown very well with Ron Rivera. He would have been gone. Regard- he would have been cut ASAP. Oh, It'll he would have to see what Pete Carroll does. With him. Hey, now he would have been released before it even hit the news. Um, yeah, right. And I'm not, I'm not the type of person to wish bad on anybody, but I mean, it's, it's all, it's kind of poetic in a way for sure. Definitely with how everything right. turned out, you know, definitely at the, at the end of his tenure with Washington for sure. Exactly. Right. I'm not saying that he deserves to be arrested, but he deserves to be arrested. I just want to say <laughs> karma, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely. Look, it sucks to say that um, because now two previous Redskins have had uh, altercations with the law. I think Brashad Breeland's, I saw that video afterwards. I, I don't think he was in the r- complete wrong there. I think that cop was kind of weird. Um, but this whole incident, this is really weird. Because not only are you, like, dude, shouldn't you be in Seattle? Like, don't they have stay-at-home orders there right now? What are you doing out of your house right. robbing people right now? Go inside, dude. Why, the story people. The story is insane. Have you guys heard the story yet? No. The, so the cops, me? reportedly the cops are saying that Baker and Dunbar were allegedly hanging at a cookout, playing cards and video games when an argument broke out, and Baker whipped out a semi-automatic firearm. Cops then say that men began to rob the party. Both of them began to rob the party guests with Dunbar assisting in taking watches and other valuables at the direction oh of Baker. <laughs> So it was like a Pulp Fiction thing, like holding. Yeah, the bag I mean, it was, it was, it was, like, it was that bad. In here. Oh my Jeez. God! The only thing that would have made that any better would have been if Quentin Dunbar pulled a page out of Earl Thomas's book and used his brother. <laughs> oh, just no. been double, double teaming robberies together. Right. <laughs> he, 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 now, now he's going to come out with a, a quote and saying, you know, I, it's really unfortunate that this got out. You know, as a personal matters. 
between right. me and my friend. <laughs> right. Pray for us. One big misunderstanding. Right. <laughs> what is going on with defensive backs this offseason? You know, Pashad Breeland, Earl Thomas and his brother, and now Quentin Dunbar and DeAndre Baker. What is what is happening? With I don't DBs know, in this but uh, they need to get out of this quarantine. It's making people go crazy. <laughs> yeah, we should rename this quarantine corner teen. Right, guys? <laughs> no, I'll shoot myself out. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good bit. But in all reality, I mean, that sucks for Quinn Dunbar. Um, you know, he was a Jay Gruden guy. Uh, he w- came in here as a wide receiver. Jay transitioned him to corner. He worked hard and was actually uh, did pretty well. It's just the Redskins did not want to give him a raise, uh, given the fact of he didn't come and talk to Ron. Um, and based on what he showed last season, they, they, they weren't comfortable with giving him a raise. And good thing they didn't uh, because they looked like the smart right. ones there. Um, and they got a fifth round pick for getting rid of somebody they would have released all, um, anyway, uh, given what we know now. Right. So, um, Next thing I wanted to talk about, Urban Meyer had some comments regarding Dwayne Haskins. So, Parker, I'll go to you first regarding this. Um, He had talked about with Dwayne Haskins, and one quote in particular that stood out to me. He said, if you want Haskins to be great, you have to surround him with a great locker room and great guys. What What is your interpretation of that quote, and what of Urban Meyer's assessment of Dwayne Haskins? Well, when I hear that, I initially think of one thing. It, it, it almost sounds as if it's a backhanded compliment. So yeah. why, are, why, why do some people – I mean, why Urban in particular? Why would you say that it would take everything around Dwayne to be almost picture perfect in order for him to get successful results for the Washington Redskins? In my opinion, the Redskins had a phenomenal start to the 2018 season with Alex Smith. And was, every, was Alex Smith the pinnacle of success for that team? Absolutely not but he kept their heads above water. He made the right amount. He made the right plays. You know, he ran when he had to slid when he had to, you know, everybody knows the end of that season was absolutely tragic, but you know, you just gotta, you gotta sit there and think that why does all of it have to fall on Dwayne Haskins shoulder shoulders? I know we live in a time where, you know, you have your Patrick Mahomes who can make all the throws, do all the things that a franchise quarterback can do. But at the same time, Dwayne Haskins doesn't have to bear all that weight on his shoulders. You know, that's why we went on and got a chase young. That's why we added, you know, guys like Antonio Gainey golden. That's why we got guys like Terry McLaurin, you know, Dwayne Haskins does not have to be to, to carry all that weight on his shoulders. You know, it, it, it football is a team game at the end of the day. And, yeah. and, and quite frankly, I don't think all of it is on Dwayne. No, you're, you're absolutely right. right about that. And I do think you're right about it being a backhanded compliment because that's what I took away from it, that this is urban Meyer trying to be realistic and honest and speak the truth about Dwayne, but without pissing Dwayne off, without ruining Dwayne's psyche and his confidence. Um, it almost seems that way. Like he's talking in code, trying to say, dude, get your shit together. Um, but look, I, absolutely. I, I haven't seen anything on the opposite. Uh, for me personally, he's been working his ass off. Um, and he's been working really hard, which is all I've wanted uh, since he's been drafted here. And sky's the limit for him. Reed, what, did, what was your interpretation? One of, the, one of the big things that I took away from it is when Urban Meyer said that he's got guys in the locker room that he communicates with, that some of his guys are in the locker room. There, there was only two guys in the locker room last year that I can think of off the top of my head from Ohio State that he had, which is <laughs> Dwayne exactly. Haskins and Terry McLaurin. Yep. I don't think McLaurin would make those comments. Uh, granted, it is known that the Redskins are kind of a dumpster fire. That, that you know, I mean, the culture just wasn't good. But I think you're completely right. It was kind of a backhanded compliment. Like, what are you trying to say? That he can't be successful unless he's in the picture-perfect situation? And, yeah. and Dwayne, he has said that Dwayne has a lot of a lot of talent. He's one of the most talented players that he's coached. And it, he's right. You don't throw 50 touchdowns your senior year. At, or I'm sorry, your redshirt sophomore year at Ohio State if you're not talented. So he does have talent, but it, it definitely was, I think, a kind of a little shot at his character. And, I mean, was it warranted? I, I don't know. I don't know, Dwayne. But I do like what I've seen from Dwayne this offseason. Yeah, and there's not, you, I don't think there's anybody out there right now that would say that Dwayne hasn't done enough. Um, because even during his quarantine, he's been working his butt off to get better. And I don't think there's, there's nothing wrong with that in the slightest bit. What about you, Hall? Do you, do you have any issue with Urban Meyer's uh, comments with Haskins? Uh, not at all, because, I mean, if you go back to pre-draft stuff, when he said he was going to enter the draft and leave school and blah, 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 he's been echoing the same thing the whole time, that yep. he needs to mature more, he's immature. That's uh, true. He needs, like you said, the right culture around him. And, I mean, if you go back to the roster at Ohio State, Terry McLaurin was the third or fourth best receiver, and he comes to the league as almost rookie of the year instantly. So that just goes to show you they had the depth and the talent around him offensively and defensively-wise. And so, I mean, like you said, Throwing 50 touchdowns in the Big Ten, obviously breaking records, is like he's talented. He has a 
the the wherewithal would be great and good uh, at the maximum, but it's just, is he going to put in the time and effort? And like you said, you in a reference to Twitter picture where you can clearly see he's down a good 15 to 20 pounds. 220 right now. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can see his cheekbones. I was actually like shocked when I saw the right. picture. I was like, whoa, that's like lost a new... his baby fat. Right? Yeah. I was like, wow, that's crazy. So, I mean, he's putting in the work. He's in the gym. And like you said, Kyle, uh, I, all I want him to do is work hard. And if it doesn't pan out, it'll be his fault. But I don't want it to be outside entities that make him fail. Yeah. You're, to me, know, oops. Sorry, Reed. Uh, uh, real quick, uh, though, I was just going to yeah. say a funny point uh, because Urban Meyer, in that in that comment, he made a comment how, like, he you need a locker room around him like we had at Ohio State. And, look, that's great, Urban, but you're allowed to recruit and go bring guys in. The Redskins can't really go out and recruit yeah. great people to bring in around Haskins right now, you know? So uh, right. thanks for that comment, Urban. I really appreciate that. Right. <laughs> one, thing, one thing that's been kind of weird is how – involved with the Redskins Urban Meyer has seemed to be over like the last few years. Yeah. So Ur- Urban Meyer's popping up all over the place. All of a sudden he's good friends with Dan-, Dan Snyder. I know that he's been good friends with Alex Smith going back to the college days at Utah. But he, he just seemed to keep – he keeps popping up. Apparently he was he was giving them advice on who to pick as a coach. Remember there's a rumor that he was going to coach the Redskins or take a job in the front office. And he's just – he's all around this Ohio State part two Washington Redskins team. <laughs> well, I, I feel like the the – Dwayne Haskins, quote unquote, praise is very like underwhelming in comparison to what he said about Chase Young today as well. Right. You guys exactly. haven't seen those comments? That's a hundred percent true. That's a hundred percent true. I, from what I saw, uh, Parker, it was basically he just never seen a talent like that before. Never had anybody right. come through the program like and that before, including the Boses. Yeah. Yeah. That's very high praise. And then to, to come out and, and say about Dwayne, uh, actually his actual quote was, as far as I've seen a player come as far as leadership and toughness. So it, he just keeps – there's these underlying hints of there needs to be improvement there, whereas, you know, right. we're, we're talking about a guy that needs to come in this season and turn the ship in D.C. Yeah, so. and the one weird really – I just – I'm telling you, I, it just really irks me when I read this quote in particular. If you – want Haskins to be great you know that you if you want it like if Dan Snyder if you are invested enough in Dwayne Haskins if you want him to be great this is what you have to do not if Dwayne wants to be great this is what Dwayne has to do I just really had an issue with that quote in particular because it's almost like he's literally talking to Snyder which further cements the fact that you know this is a a motivated pushing of Haskins onto us by Snyder. And that's uh, that's how I'm kind of like taking it away from Urban Meyer here with that quote. That's what it's really irking me. And I don't think that's the, the case in, in 100%. I do think there is some uh, some uh, added to it with Snyder and, and Haskins with Bullis, but it's just really weird to me. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. And uh, it, it, I, I feel like I'm reading a, a political newspaper when I read this. I mean, it's, it's perfectly say political because no matter how I feel about Dwayne Haskins, no matter how much improvement he made in that last uh, four game stretch in the last season, no matter how much improvement he made during the offseason, no matter how much he's worked out, how much he slimmed down, the jury's still out on Haskins at yeah. the end of the day. This is a prove it year. So <laughs> you're absolutely right. It is for prove it year and it's a prove it year for a lot of guys um, in particular. But Dwayne Haskins, it's it's more concentrated than ever. Um, and we had talked about earlier uh Mike Hall had brought it up, but there was a twic- uh, picture floating around Twitter today of Haskins looking really, really thin, very skinny. And I'm not sure why all of a sudden now a quarantine had to happen where everyone else is inside. Now Haskins can go outside and work out. <laughs> I don't understand what's happening, but I'm loving what I'm seeing. Hall, I know that you, the cheekbones and everything, but do you think just by going outside, running around, working out, and being in shape, do you think Haskins has done enough this offseason to convince the coaching staff and the Redskins organization that he is their quarterback? Uh, I'm going to say – I would say yes, just from the things that I was, like, hearing from Ron Rivera back when you could actually visit the facility. He said he always uh, see Dwayne in the facility working out. He always stop and say hi in his office. Uh I mean, he's been posting videos in the facility of him working out before the quarantine. Obviously, he's been throwing with uh, some high school people or high school friends that he grew up with at uh, whatever fields. So, I mean, yeah, he's been putting in the work and uh, from all accounts in the in the uh, virtual meetings for the installation of the offense and the uh, OTAs. He's been soaking everything up pretty good. And uh, like you said, it just comes down to uh, getting on the field and uh, actually putting it into action. And uh it's, it, like you said, the jury's still out. We'll see. And, uh, I mean, I have confidence that he'll be 
bounds and leaps better than last year, which obviously wasn't very good. But, I mean, I, like you said before, 2018, they were winning games with the running game and defense. And the running game is still there, and the defense is even better. All Dwayne has to go do is go out there and uh, just be Alex Smith light and just manage yep. the game and take the big shots when you can. So I think yep. he can do that. Yeah, and I think Reed would absolutely love that uh, from Haskins playing his uh, best Alex Smith impersonation that we've talked about before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is the jury still out on Haskins? Yes, but I do think that he's taken a, a pretty good first step in developing a relationship at least as much as he can during this quarantine with the coaching staff. It seems like he has a good relationship with Rivera and Scott Turner, especially Ron Rivera. He came out and said that Rivera was selling him through the entire draft process to just trust him, and he's got his back, and he did. And I think that that would go a long way with him. But we're not really going to know if he – if he's done enough until they get to get on the field until we can actually see what, what he can do, how well he picks up the offense, uh, how advanced he is, how, how much he understands and he meshes with his receivers. So I think it's going to take a little bit, but I do think that it's very good that he has been working on his own and going out and throwing and also losing weight to spite his ex-girlfriend, I'm assuming, because I'm pretty sure they broke up. Oh, I'm not no. going to let go of that conspiracy up. theory yet. <laughs> um, but I think that that's one of the reasons he lost weight and use it as motivation. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think that the jury's still out, but I do like what I'm seeing from him. He has taken the correct first steps, in my opinion, from what we know. Yes, you're absolutely right. And speaking of first steps, a uh, Deron Payne, uh, I know that we talked about a couple weeks ago, Mike Reed, uh, you love Trey Adams truck pushing. Well, Deron Payne did his own version today. Did you, did, were you able to see that? Yeah, I did. It was way more impressive because you didn't get to see this giant mongoloid face pop up. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. We had a big discussion on here just about how ugly Trey Adams is. And, and Deron Payne looked a lot better doing it than Trey Adams did. I, I will say that. Yeah, it's a good point. And look, it, I, I, it's impressive to say the least. And uh, I'm glad that the Redskins players, you know, they're, they're not just chilling around playing video games and not just wasting their life away. You know, like they're out there working out and they want to show you guys that they're working out and they're, they're trying to stay busy. I really do appreciate that. Uh, were you able to catch the video there, Parker? I actually, I just saw it like 10 minutes ago. looks like a red Silverado. Oh my God. That's insane. Dude. He is a That's huge a boy. I've seen it. Dude. He look, he, he looks huge, but he has a baby <laughs> face. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, dude. Mm -hmm. I'm out of a camp, man. He is like one of the nicest people you will ever meet. Oh, really? That, that's what I've that's what I've heard about him. Is he looks so intimidating, but apparently he's just a giant teddy bear, just super giant nice. until, he, bear. until he puts on until he puts on that helmet. In which case, you better watch out. I just hope the Redskins, man, hop on it and and get them locked up early, man. They need to keep these guys together their whole careers. I just hope they stay on right. top of it. Yeah, and this is something that we had actually talked about um, earlier in the off season because. Everyone was saying, you know, they wanted Dunbar to stay. They wanted to go sign all these free agents. And we were on here saying, guys, calm down. They they not only have to sign guys that are might possibly be leaving here, but they're going to have to extend the good players. They're going to have to extend Jonathan Allen before Deron Payne. Then Deron Payne's going to be a year after him. So you're going to have a bunch of contracts lining up, and they're doing a good job of making sure they have that cap space sitting there and they have the money to spend when they need it. I love that aspect from them, uh, the way that they're looking at this offseason, the way that they're going after it, because if we know anything about Ron Rivera, he loves himself some D-line. And if he's going to make sure that they're going to have that defensive line locked up for the long term, I think the Redskins and Chase Young, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to play offense. If I was in the NFC East and I was on offense, I was like, dude, I retire. No, I'm not playing this game. It's just not fun. Uh, having to having to go against Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne on top of having Chase Young there and then Montez Sweat on the other side, you, you just can't block that right now. I'm and sorry. Everybody forgets Matt Ioannidis. Yeah, Matt Ioannidis. Yeah. Man, Pro Bowler last Big year. Tim the Settle guy coming uh, in, rotational player yeah, right. as well. Like, uh oh, so, yeah. uh oh. <laughs> and speaking of, actually, this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about today, and I wanted to get your guys' ideas on how you think the defensive line is going to shape out this season. I know we could talk left. We can talk all night about how the offensive line is going to look, how the corners are going to look. The defensive line, where we have so much talent, I think there needs to be a discussion on who is going to get most of those reps, how they're going to be able to do the rotation. So, Reed, I'll go to you first. Who do you expect to be that starting lineup, and then who would who would be the offsetting immediate relief? I think that there's going to be so many different formations and so many different types of of 
lineups with that D line that they're not going to necessarily have a set starting for. But I would say that inside, everybody wants to always mention automatically Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen. But I think you really got to look at Matt Ioannidis. He's somebody who made the Pro Bowl last year. He's done nothing but improve every year. And I think that Ioannidis on up front with Allen would probably, just based off of last year, uh, probably be the two starters at defensive tackle. And then, of course, with Chase Young and Monta Sweat on the outside. But they're all going to be rotating so much that I don't think it really matters who starts from one game to the next because Deron Payne's going to get his snaps. And then Ryan Kerrigan's going to get his snaps. It's just going to be a giant rotation between guys. And I'm excited for it. I mean, heaven forbid, if there's an injury or something like there has been for the last couple of years, then I, I, I could totally see somebody stepping up and definitely getting more snaps. But it really, I think it's going to be a pretty even layout there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one thing, Matt Ioannidis can actually rush from the edge position. So you could talk about having them in pass situations or running downs, having being able to have Matt Ioannidis, Deron Payne, uh, Jonathan Allen, and Chase Young at the front four. Um, that is absolutely disgusting. I don't care who your defensive li- uh, offensive line is. That's going to be hard to match up against. Uh, Hall, how do you think that's going to play out? Yeah, uh, I was just going to say I'm pretty much in agreement with Reed also and with you. I was going to say there's so many different combinations you can set in there. I don't think there's going to be actual set starters, but uh, obviously the edges are going to be set with Chase Young and Montez Sweat. Mm -hmm. But those uh, two interior guys, I think it's just going to be a four-man rotation of just punishment and hell coming in at you 24-7 throughout the game, all four quarters. And like you said, uh, you can move Jonathan Allen around the line. Ioannidis can rush from the edge. You can move Chase all around the the line. So it's just going to, like I said, it's just going to be just an onslaught of – rushers coming up the field aggressively at the quarterback as Ron likes to say. Yeah, and Jack Del Rio would actually uh, would echo that sentiment as well. Parker, what do you think? I want to hear this. You know, I, I feel like we finally have a guy at the helm now in Jack Del Rio that's going to put the pieces together to finally run a proper 4-3 defense. You know, I feel like we've, you know, miscast a lot of people and put them in positions where they really weren't in the best possible – I say it's – I hate to say position again, but the position to succeed. Mm. Um, I, I, I got to just go out of right and say it. I, I think Chase Young gets more reps than Ryan Kerrigan for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I just think that Ryan Kerrigan's at the tone of his career. You know, he's one he's one sack away from breaking Dexter Manley's record. There's nothing wrong with it. Ryan Kerrigan has had an absolutely phenomenal career in Washington. He has nothing to be ashamed of. But, man, Chase Young is just – he's a force. And he's just going to dominate the man in front of him no matter who it is. And, and nothing against Ryan Kerrigan. But, like I said, he's on the tone of his career. You know, he's been banged up a lot. And I, I feel like the young bucks are going to get a chance to shine in 2020. And that's for sure. No matter where you put them. Yeah. And right. Jack Del Rio actually had a quote recently. I think he did an interview if I'm not mistaken, but he had a quote that I, I picked apart. And one of the things he said was, you know, I want to make sure that these guys are being moved and now they're being used in an attacking. We're letting them cut loose. We're letting them be on attack and allowing them to go after and seek. The reason why I'm picking that apart, because in years past, it, what he's telling you is that Minuski's defense was a cover three. What they would do is they would they would g- engage the blocker and then read the run. What Jack Del Rio is saying here is, no, dude, we're doing an attacking style defense. We're bringing it to you. We're not going to react to anything. We're going to impose our will on you, and we're going to beat you into the ground. That kind of tenacity, that mindset, that's what makes a juggernaut in D.C., and that's, what, that's what's been missing for 20 years, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, As Ron Rivera yeah. has loved loved to say, you play the you play the run on the way to the quarterback. That's yeah. the way that that's his defensive philosophy. I think that's a great one to have. And could you just imagine real quick in, in certain formations? Because we know just because you're in a base four three doesn't mean that you're gonna be in that right. formation all the time. Yeah. Teams use so many different types of personnel, but just imagine if you will, the three down linemen, you have Deron Payne. Jonathan Allen and Matt Ioannidis, and then you stand up Montez Sweat and Chase Young and have them rush from the edge. Those five pass rushers right there on the field, good luck. Good luck blocking that. I don't care what who's on your offensive line. I don't care how many tight ends you have in there. That's going to be hell. Yeah, I mean, we're asking, you know, who starts, you know, who who gets the most in the rotation. Those guys are starters on any other team, and yeah. we're, we just have an abundance right. of riches at the position. I mean, it's right. honestly insane. I mean, four straight seasons, first-round draft picks in the defensive line. I, I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, like I said, just an abundance of riches. Yeah, and we've said it before. Uh, this team, especially this year, the defensive line unit and the rushers, it reminds me of the, the Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl year, the defensive line that they had, the rotation that they had. It seemed like it didn't matter right. who they had coming off the sideline. They were somebody that, would, that was going to be able to get to the quarterback and the Redskins are going to be able to have that. 
um, especially this year with Ryan Kerrigan in the helm uh, behind him. And then uh, Malcolm Smith, the seventh round rookie that they got, is a guy who could become a pass rusher as well and just provide depth. So you're absolutely right, dude. It's kind of re- sickening um, how good this rotation is right now. So, yeah, I mean, I think Kerrigan's going to get a revival in his career just coming in on special yeah. rushing downs and just like you said, special uh, passing downs. And I mean, he's always been a good playing the run, so he's going to set the edge for you anyway. I just think that, uh, like you said, this front four is just going to be deadly. And uh, I just can't wait to watch it. Yeah, and the one thing in particular I wanted to point out before we move on uh, to the top three um, moments of Redskins history was I think I think Chase Young learning from Ryan Kerrigan is quite possibly the best thing for Chase Young at this point. Um, where Ryan Kerrigan, you know, he doesn't have all the talent in the world. You know, he's not Von Miller. He's not Khalil Mack. You know, he's he, obviously he's in the NFL. He's athletic. But the thing is, he's not like he's not going to blow you away with anything. He's a hard worker. He does things with his mind. He puts himself in a certain position to be able to make plays. And he continues to work hard. Chase Young learning with Ryan Kerrigan, having that kind of uh, role model there. Uh, sky's the limit for Chase Young. I think that's the best possible scenario for him. Yeah, absolutely. Right. All right, he, so he's a lunch pail guy. Yeah, you absolutely. Bring your lunch pail. It's going to be a long day. Yeah, true, he's a he's a true professional man. You couldn't learn from anyone better. No, absolutely. Right. So let's move on to our top three Redskins moments. We're going to go one by one, um, and this is from the early '90s, guys. So like, I, I'm 30. So you know, we wanted to make sure that this was a concentrated and this was going to be very hard to do. So Hall, I'll go to you first. I know you probably got some really good ones. L- give me your third most. Uh, red best moment in Redskins history since the 90s well at number three I'm gonna go back to 2015 five years ago I was actually at this game week 11 uh Redskins oh, yeah. versus Packers <laughs> a glorious 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 oh, game for Kirk choice. Cousins I mean one of the things that just stands out in my mind off breaks was Kirk Cousins was just on fire that game yeah I mean, remember Fat Rob had that one good rookie season he was here? Yep. He rushed for, let me just check my paper, 24 rushes, 137 yards, and three touchdowns. Just balled out that game. Hold up, Mike, before you, was... before, you, before you keep going, we, we have a second show that we do called the Sports Drunkies. And what we do is we, we, like, we do the breakdowns for the games the day of and everything. Well, this week in particular – Mike had gone to FedEx Field to watch this game with yep. two Packers fans that are in sports drunkies. And before, they did a pregame video. And they were on the video talking about they were about to destroy the Redskins. <laughs> the Redskins sucked <laughs> and everything. I, I, I'm not kidding you. Two hours into that game, there, a video gets uploaded of Michael Hall going, Woo! Just screaming <laughs> in their face. I was getting to that. I was going to be like... About halfway into the third quarter, into the fourth quarter, I had a, a Facebook Live video panned on both Packers fans and all the Packers fans in the section because, you know, FedEx feels like to get taken over by all the opposing fans. Yep. I knew there was, like, that many Packers fans in the DMV area. It's kind of crazy. But all I'm just seeing is you just see me going, woo, just a Rick Flair all over the stadium. <laughs> Pants to some lady that literally has tears in her eyes, like walking out the stadium with a, a cheese head on her. I was just like, woo, maybe next time. I mean, what can I say? One of the the most glorious times I've been to a Redskins game. I mean, obviously we ended up losing to the Packers in the playoffs that yeah. uh, following a couple upcoming weeks later. But I mean, just for me to be there that night, for me to rub it in our boys' face, shout out to Bernard and Sazzy. I mean, it was just glorious, and that's number three for me. I love that one, Reed. What's yours? I forget exactly what year it was. I kind of threw this part on there because I just remembered as we were getting ready to come on the show. But uh, it was Sean Taylor's fumble return against the Eagles to seal the division for it, to seal a playoff spot for us. Uh, I think it was 2006. That was, and then the that was against the Eagles, and then the following week against the Buccaneers, he also had a fumble return for a touchdown. That's also when he spit in Mark or in Michael Pittman's face. (laughs) And I just I remember that was just so glorious, just having that guy that person that everybody loved old sean taylor out there making the two biggest plays of the games and of course we went on to lose against the seahawks i believe in the second round of the playoffs but it, it was just so much fun to see you know that that redskins team was a lot of fun back then those were those were some pretty good teams that they had yeah and that, that was a special special time uh to say the least so parker what is your number three sir all right my number three selection uh top three redskins moments of my lifetime uh we're up 31-26 
uh, week six, 2012 season, RG3, 76 yards, then the left sideline against the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, yeah. I remember, man, I ran around my house about as fast as he ran down the field. I absolutely <laughs> lost my mind. I lost my mind. You weren't I mean, the only was, one. I, I'm not going to say that was the – yeah, I, I'm not going to say that that was the peak of the RG3 rookie year, but that was definitely one of my favorite moments. You know, Minnesota right. was actually 4-1 uh, and one that season. They were doing really well, shockingly, with Christian Ponder at the home. But, you know, that was just – like you were saying, how Sean Taylor was that difference maker for that uh, Redskins team in that season. Uh, RG3 just showing that he was a difference maker for that team in 2012. Just a great moment. Yeah, and I think uh, – Hall, were we watching that game together? I'm pretty sure we were, yeah. Dude, that it went, was... It went to overtime, right? That was the overtime game? Oh, I think so. Was it? I, don't I think you're talking about the Ravens game. No, yeah. You're, no, yeah. He's yeah, thinking Ravens of the Ravens game. Yeah, Ravens game was overtime, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, that game was so much... I'll never forget. Uh, we were in my sister's basement watching RG3 run up that Viking sideline, and I didn't even watch him go into the end zone. Just like you, Park. I just started running. <laughs> I just ran yeah. out of the room, you know? <laughs> I was just so excited just seeing... And the funny thing is, when you look back on that season... You know, it just went by so fast. You wish that you could, you know, yeah. go through it again because it was so special after so many years of being pummeled and just being so bad and the electricity that was brought to this city and this fan base. God, man, I miss that season. I miss that season so much. Yeah, man, but, me too. And, you know, it's, it's no disrespect to Kirk Cousins, but, you know, no matter how many entries you give him on the list, I don't feel like all of his moments can equate to how great that 2012 season was. Without a doubt. Right. Without, Without a, doubt. a doubt. I don't think anybody would, would argue that either. Um, nah, that That is a, a great point by you, just because of where they were at that time. Now, my number th- my number three, um, I, kn- I know it's kind of stupid, but I, I have to do it just because you guys took all the good ones. I'm going D. Hall's seven interception game against Jay Cutler. I mean, <laughs> seven <laughs> interception? You mean the four? Oh, game. sorry, four interceptions. Sorry, what he had, <laughs> I he had, was like seven. Sorry, so wait, did he have? Oh so wait, so wait, did he have? Did he have seven <laughs> interceptions for the season? Is that what it was? I think so. Yeah, he had four yeah. in that game against, against, against Jay. Yeah, Bears. four yeah. four interceptions in one game against Jay Cutler. I mean, D. Hall made his career off of Jay, just off that one game. Yeah. Right. That game was absolutely nuts, man. I mean, it's just like wherever Jay went with the ball, <laughs> D. Hall was right there. And, I mean, and, you just yeah. saw it on. Jay's a very unenthusiastic person, but you could just see on his face he was just he was just miserable and just loathing Paul's entire existence. And as right. and as uh, embarrassing that is for Jay Cutler, even though he threw four picks at D Hall, I'm pretty sure the Redskins like barely won that game. Oh, right. yeah, it was close. It was still close. This is like the crazy part about. Was it Rex Grossman the quarterback? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, but but by the way, shout out to Jay Cutler with his uh, recent divorce from Kristen Cavallari and her saying, what was it? Her saying that he was lazy and him, yeah. that she wanted his house and him saying, well, why don't you get a job? I was like, <laughs> he is Ooh. winning off the field. <laughs> Dude, I thought I didn't think he could get more boss than when that picture got uploaded of him being naked Old on a boat smoking, smoking a cigarette. Jay. Yeah. Yeah. Smoking Jay. He outdid himself with that quote. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Good for Jay, man. Good right. For Jay. Incredible. Right. So I'll start off um, with the number two. And my number two is actually from 2012. RG3's first touchdown pass to Pierre Garçon against the Saints when he laid on the ground and pointed his fingers in the air. Um, I'll never forget. I was at work. And uh, I was at Noodles and Company on the grill. And uh, they didn't have, like, you know, Game Pass or anything. Or like, You couldn't go on your phone and watch the game on your phone. Like, I had to go to the ESPN Sports Cast. It would upload each play. And I remember looking at it, and the game starts like, all right, I'm going to look in like two minutes. I looked at it, and I was like, Redson scored a touchdown. I was like, already? And I was like, okay, I put my phone down. Two minutes later, 14-0. <laughs> what? what the hell? That was such a special game for me. That was right. one of the biggest ones because that, that was when the tires started kicking on that season. And that's when things started right. really turning around was that game one against the Saints. And that's when we knew that this was a good team. Right. And shout out to the Shanahan's too with an yeah. excellent game plan and, and oh, yeah. that – the, on the, especially on the first drive of that game, just getting RG3 in a rhythm by throwing nonstop screens. I think they threw like four straight screen passes. It was like all of that PR game off to get RG3 yeah. comfortable. Right. Oh, yeah, Shane and then he had that absolutely dime master. Garcon. Yep. And I, not many people know, Pierre Garçon on that play um, actually suffered a turf toe injury, and that lingered throughout the whole season, and he continued to play and mm-hmm. actually played really well. Mm-hmm. All right, so Reed, uh, right. so hold yeah, my I remember bad. I was actually yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, I, what happened? You want me to use my number two or what? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, I actually had the scoop and score for Sean Taylor, my number two. <laughs> but just off the top of my head, it's probably not my number two, but this is up, definitely up there as uh, my top moments in Redskins history. 
I want to say it was 2010, maybe 11, but pretty sure 2010. Uh, Monday Night Football, first game of the season, Redskins Cowboys at a FedEx Field. Uh, Redskins are up by whatever points it is. Tony Romo's leading them down the field, and it's one of those like, uh, here we go again. Same old Redskins gonna lose the game. Like here we go, blah blah blah. They get it down within like the ten yard line, five yard line, three seconds left. Uh, hike the ball. Tony Romo scrambling around for what seemed like an eternity. Nobody could get to him, and the whole time I'm screaming at Kelsey Kramer's house because this is when Gavin was dating her. Brian Arapo's getting held. He's getting held. No, why they're not calling that? So of course I'm just like. Normal Redskins never going to get the calls. This is bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Of course, Tony Romo throws a touchdown pass. I'm just, like, flipping out, like, ah! <laughs> Lo and behold, I look at the screen, and the good old right corner is at, like, the yellow flags, the yellow flag sign. They actually did call the holding on Brian Arakpo. Redskins win the game, and we just celebrated for, like, until, like, 3 in the morning that night because it was mostly Redskins fans in the house tonight. And, again, that was just one of those moments where it just stuck out because – it's just one of those great Cowboys wins that every Redskins fan loves. I was That's an actually, underrated one. Yeah, it is. I was actually at that game. Um, I was nice. sitting. I was sitting at the pylon on the Redskins side of the field um, when that pass went down. Um, I saw. I was watching Des Bryant wide open. And I was sitting. No, 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 yeah. no. Watched yeah, him catch yeah. it. I was like, no, oh, God. And I saw. Then I saw the flag on the field, and I saw the Redskins players rushing the field. You're absolutely right, Hall. That was a very underrated. Uh, time for the Redskins that was a good one uh Reed what's your next one uh, I'm gonna go with the end of that 2012 season at, at first I had the entire seven game run to make the playoffs but I'm gonna go with that Rob Jackson interception uh to kind of seal the deal against the Cowboys in week 17 and uh followed up which would have been a 3a for me would would have been Trent Williams punching Richard Sherman in the face the next week against Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great one it is a great one I I have respect for Trent Williams just because of that that game, um, for Redskins fans that watched that game, you watched Richard Sherman hit Pierre Garçon after the whistle every single play, was chip shotting him the whole time, and that's what pissed off Trent Williams. And that's why he walked up to Richard Sherman and punched him in the face because it was bullshit. Uh, he man, told him he was going to do it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he said it. And that's why he's a boss. All right, so Parker, who's your? what's your number two, sir? All right, I hate to be redundant. Uh, I'm kind of piggybacking off my calls. Um, so uh, week eight, 2014, uh, pretty dismal season. We start off two and five. The Colt McCoy-led Redskins pull off the upset on Monday Night Football over the Dallas Cowboys. As I like to call it, the Bashaw Breeland. Uh, yep. That was kind of yeah. his, his coming out performance. Destroyed Dez, right. Absolutely shut down Des Bryant. And Colt himself threw for 299 yards and actually ran for a touchdown. Yep. I know Alfred Morris had a pretty good game. I think he scored once on the ground. Uh, but we won, uh, t- I think it was 20 to 17 in overtime. Yeah. And that, and that, that is a great that. one. Cause whenever we beat the Cowboys, especially on national television, it's always a, a better, a better night for everybody. I think, I think we were at the bar that night. I think we were at gentleman Jim's, uh, my call. I'm not sure if you remember that night. Yeah. I, be- I believe when they, so. when, I believe yeah, they so. were giving out free so. pizza. Oh yeah. That was like the staple of gentleman Jim's. Yeah. But the free pizza. For us to pick up a win in prime time like that just doesn't happen a lot for Redskins at all anymore. Right. I mean, I can't tell you last time we had a big primetime win over Dallas like that. Right, and especially with Colt McCoy um, um, at the helm, too, which just speaks volumes. Now, <laughs> my my number one, um, I guess I guess I'm gonna, my number two, uh, I guess I'm going to say, is the last game of the season um, after Sean Taylor passed away, um, the Redskins whooped ass on the Cowboys to advance to the playoffs. Um, that's, that's the special one for me. That's, that's, uh, that's, it hits home because that, that season was something special. Um, going to see that Bills game and seeing the players, you know, running to the end zone, getting on one knee. It just, y- you felt something building there, um, with that team. I just, I felt like it was, it was a lot more special, uh, to Redskins fans than the most realized because of 2012 and everything. But that run was so special for many, many reasons. Um, but that, that's why I have it as my number two. So, Hall, well, let's go to your one. Yeah, it's kind of redundant. My number one was just because the drought had been so long from the playoffs. I mean, everyone was, like, on the whole, like, Redskins are, like, the Browns of the NFL at that point. Like, they're horrible. It's Dan Snyder's fault, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, RG3 comes in. He's supposed to be the savior, the great hope. He's going to turn the franchise around, which he did for a year. But, uh, yeah, I was going to say the Week 17 
win against the Cowboys 2012 to win the division for all the marbles. Uh, I mean, RG3 was just coming back from injury kind of sorter. So uh, he only threw the ball 18 times, was 9 for 18, which is 50%. It's kind of bad. Only 100 yards. He had uh, six rushes for 63 yards on the ground and a touchdown. But the MVP Alfred star of that Morris game. Alfred Morris went off. Mr. Yeah. Morris, Alfred Morris went off that game. 33 rushes for 200 yards and three touchdowns. I mean, they were just feeding him, feeding him, feeding the rock. The O-line was beasted out. And, again, just because of the drought and the playoffs and just like the, uh, the the hope that everyone had for the future of the Redskins going forward, it was just one of those special times. And, again, Kyle knows I was the biggest RG3 fan there is. Like, I would not latch on to Kirk Cousins until, like <laughs> – He did I never. Finally, yeah. I Finally, <laughs> I was just like – Finally, I was like, you know what? I'll give it to Kirk. He's better than RG3. It was probably 2015 season after RG3 got injured again. I was like, you know what? I'm done with him. Like, I, you know, I got, I got to say something right there while you're on the note of that. You know, let's be honest with ourselves here. In the 2015 season, who were the starting quarterbacks in the NFC East? If you guys can name all them, I'll be impressed. But it was a very poor starting lineup. 2015? 2015. Yeah. No, okay. Eagles. Go with Eagles. Who do you think was the starting uh, quarterback for the Eagles? Was that Kevin Cobb that year? Sam, Sam Bradford. Bradford. Yeah. Sam Bradford. Sam Bradford. Perfect, that's Kyle. Right, that's perfect. Right. And, and then Tony Romo would have been for the Cowboys, right? Or was he hurt that year? Kellen, he was hurt. Kellen Moore. Yeah, I was going to say Kellen, Kellen Moore. Moore. That's right. That's what, that's what I thought, right? And then Damn, the that Giants. Is true. And then Eli that Manning was Eli, there. Yeah. yeah. That's so, when Eli I mean, started getting dumb face. People can gallivant Kirk and scream you like that and talk about all those <laughs> games in 2015, man. But at the end of the day, it took him – for him to get to the pinnacle and be NFC's champions, it, it – Everybody else had to be kind of on their knees, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. No, you're, you're not you're not wrong about that at all. Not at all. Look, the Kirk in Minnesota is definitely not the Kirk that was in Washington. He was yeah. throwing games away at the last like last drive of the game as opposed to just driving him down the field and getting field goal position. So, I mean, yeah, everyone knows that that one magical season, like you said before, RG3, all his moments could never top Kirk. You know, and he, was thing. He, was, he was leading the league in passing a couple of years. You got me all sentimental with the Alfred Morris talk, man. I got a uh, <laughs> actually custom made uh, Alfred Morris uh, signed license plate from the DMV. I won in a contest hanging, oh. actually hanging above me right now. Oh, nice. good for you, dude. That sounds awesome. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, man. I was a huge fan. I, I still don't agree with how he left the organization. I was oh, actually yeah. at his uh, first return to uh, FedEx Field when uh, he faced the, when he came back playing for the Cowboys and scored the game winning touchdown. <laughs> oh, I remember did, that. Of course, of course. Yeah, I remember that one. That one. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing I did want to point out, I lost all respect for Kirk um, this offseason. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. When he said that he was very interested in seeing how the games would play out without fans in it. Um, the reason I say that is because there's been rumors of Kirk um, in big games, um, being way more psyched out, being having anxiety and stuff like that. I thought there might have been a small little bit of alpha in him. No. Not after that comment, him saying he was interested in seeing without fans because it, it worried him so much. No, I'm good, dude. No, you're not alpha at all. Peace I don't out. have anyone to disappoint. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> the, the fact that you let it get to you like that, I mean, it just speaks volumes um, to me personally. But I digress, like you said, uh, Parker. Now, Reed, let's go to you. What is your number one? Please don't steal it. Don't steal it. I can't believe don't that this it. one hasn't hasn't been said yet. Don't I'm going to go it. with the Monday Night Miracle against okay. the Cowboys when Mark oh. Brunel threw two touchdowns yeah, that was, that was in the final the three minutes of that yeah. game. That was. I just remember just being in high school and seeing a. The next day, all these Dallas fans walking into school with their Cowboys jersey on and having to break the news to them and be like, well, you guys lost. <laughs> but you went to bed because we weren't moving the ball. Did you watch the final three minutes of that game? Because uh, Santana Moss and Mark Brunel kind of beat you right there in those last three minutes. It was so magical. And then uh, Sean Taylor had the game ceiling tackle uh, on what would have been a first down to Patrick Creighton. He was right at the line. Sean Taylor just came up and just put his helmet right on the ball and just walloped him on fourth down. That right there was the game. It was a thing of beauty, and I'll, I'll never forget that next day at school. It was so satisfying rubbing that in the Cowboys fans' faces. Yeah, and you know, it, the, here being in the DMV, they have no business coming to school with their jerseys on anyway. Um, <laughs> but that being said, so let's go to you, Parker. What's your number one? Don't steal it, Parker. You know, I, I like you. Don't I, do it. <laughs> I'm I don't think I'm stealing it. Right. I'm going to go with my personal favorite. So let me set the scene for you. Of course, it's a 2012 season because God knows we've been talking about it enough as it is. <laughs> Thanksgiving Day, RG3 yeah. obliterates yeah. the Cowboys. I'm surrounded by just the epicenter of salt. You know, my family, <laughs> I, I, I said that a lot of them are Redskins fans, but a lot of them, unfortunately, are Cowboys fans as well. We don't talk a lot, but um, <laughs> RG3 just with a star-studded performance, man. We got the 30, uh, I think it was 38-31 win. 
our yeah. second win in a row at the time, you know, we just had all the momentum in the world. You know, we started off three and six, finished 10 and six. And, you know, the RG3 just completely showed out. I'll never forget that back shoulder throw to Santana Moss in the end zone. I was just about to say that. Yep. Just that, that spit the stuff out of my mouth and was losing my mind. <laughs> on a rope to Santana Moss. And then the, don't don't forget that Aldrick Robinson touchdown where RG3 just threw it as yep. far as he could. And it yeah. landed right in the yeah. bread basket of, of Aldrick Robinson. They were just they were just firing on all cylinders that day. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll never forget. I had a concussion that day because we uh, that was uh, we had turkey bowl, yeah, turkey and so bowl. We, we were. I'll never forget. I, I was uh, I was tackling somebody. I think it was Lance, and I went for his feet, and his foot like came up and like hit the bottom of my uh, my chin, so it shot my head up. And I remember like I went home and like I almost passed out on my couch because I was so tired. Like I had a huge headache. I woke up and the Redskins were were up huge, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Is this what I have to do for Redskins to win? <laughs> I got to give myself concussions? That final score was very misleading as well. I don't know that everyone remembers the end of that game. They yeah. kicked an onside kick that was dangerously close to being recovered. Right. 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 I remember <laughs> Dallas. Uh, it, it was out of reach for most of the game. And then what was it? In the fourth quarter, Dallas scored a couple touchdowns. Kind of go ahead. And then it was, yeah, it was 38 to 21. But it was – that game was an ass whooping before that. It was so yeah. great, man. I just got to yeah. flex on all the Cowboys fans, man. It just doesn't happen a lot, so I definitely appreciate it when it does. Yeah, and my, here comes my number one, and I'm so glad that none of you cucks picked it because this is by far the best, <laughs> the best moment in Redskins history since the 90s, and it is the Dallas Cowboys game when Ro- Sean Taylor picks up the blocked field goal uh, returns it, gets the face oh, mask. Yeah, oh, yeah, perfect. perfect. Puts the Redskins in position to win that game. Uh, I'll never forget, I was at work at Agri Dolce. Uh, being, I was a busboy, and I was standing at the bar getting yelled at by my boss to move, to go do work. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I, what a game that was. I mean, I remember thinking when, when Sean had the ball, I was thinking, I was like, is he, is he far enough? Can he get the field goal? Keep going. Keep going. I, you know, you saw his face mask go to the side, and then it just, it just cemented it. Um, what a game that was. Um, just like the Monday Night Miracle. It's just one of those surreal games and the outcomes. And look, Sean Ta- uh, not Sean Taylor, but you know, he was a part of it. And I had, I had to put that in there. I'm glad none of you guys picked it. Talk that. about putting the team yeah. on your back. My God. Yeah, right. Sean Taylor did that a lot. There, there I was, was going to say he did that on a lot of occasions, where, man. Like, where especially, like, a, uh, I remember against the Panthers when uh, the, they were about to pick up that first down and Sean Taylor just wouldn't – he had an interception earlier that game and then he just wouldn't let the receiver get even close to the first down marker, just grabbing him by his jersey, swinging him around, throwing him out of bounds. And then, of course, there was that game where he forced Brett Favre to set the interceptions record because he intercepted him, what was it, two or three times that game or whatever yeah. to break the – Break the interceptions record. Yeah, you got him three times that game. Yeah, it was incredible. He, he made a lot of big, a huge impact on this team. Yeah, and especially during a time where, like, offense just wasn't a thing for the Redskins. It, it seemed like Sean Taylor was our offense, too, um, especially yeah. at times. Uh, you're talking about, you know, Reed with the earlier. He talked about, you know, uh, Sean Taylor's picked up uh, a return for a touchdown to, to steal him for the, uh, the playoffs to go face the Buccaneers. Uh, Sean Taylor was just so much this goddamn organization. Um, and it's good to think about those times again. Uh, what could have been? I wish they just retired his number already. Yeah. They, and, and that needed yeah, to right. be done. Because, you know, as soon as somebody puts on, you know, as soon as somebody puts I, I on love, 21, these fans are uh, going to. No, no one will ever put 21 on as a Redskin ever right. in life. Like, well, you know, I, I love Lane Collins. I love Lane yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love Landon Collins to death, man. But I mean, you know, Kyle's got his jersey hanging on, uh, hanging behind him. My girlfriend has a jersey, man. I, all the Redskins fans I know, and he just holds a special place in everybody's heart, and you just can't replicate it. So I feel like that's the least you can do to just, you know, right. oh, you got one too, Mike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Don't just take it out of rotation. Just <laughs> Reed doesn't want to feel left <laughs> out, retired. Parker. Talk about his tattoo. <laughs> but let me see it. Let me see it. Let me see it. Sorry. Oh, it's a Nationals one. Hey, man, I, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. No, absolutely. And it just brings back those memories um, from way back in the day. But now um, I want to talk about briefly with you guys. Uh, just uh, let's go down the fantasy uh, impact here, especially with Redskins organ uh, with Redskins centrified. I guess you could say it's not even a word. I don't care. Um, the Redskins, who is going to be the best fantasy contributor this season? I know we're all going to say Terry McLaurin. But is there somebody on this team right now, I'll go to you, Hall, first, that you could see being an undercover, huge impact player for fantasy uh, commissioners? Um, 
I don't think it's going to really be undercover, but uh, it's more of like just like the steady rock that he's been for the past, what is it, going on 10, 12 years in the league now, that Adrian Peterson, I think he's poised for another breakout year like he had a couple years ago where he's going to get over 1,000 yards or close to it. I think that, again, like I said earlier, I think that Ron Rivera already has it in his mind that we're going to be a defensive team, we're going to run the ball, and we're going to limit Dwayne Haskins, and when the big players are there, he's going to take them. So I just think that AP is going to get a lot of uh, touches. I don't know if they got Darius Geis, but I think they're going to kind of mix them in together with Geis' injury history. And like I said, AP just being the rock that he's been his whole career. Yep. I think he's just poised to carry the rock and carry the team on his back this year. Yeah, and Reed, who's yours? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with something a little bit. I, I completely agree with you. I, I think that Adrian Peterson could definitely affect some teams. I'm going to go with another – unit if you will i'm gonna go with the redskins defense as a fantasy perfect receiver. answer they could, they could be a, i'm sorry about that they could be a defense <laughs> that, that really is by i would say for sure by by the midpoint of the season they will be up off they won't be available in any free agent as a, as a sign they won't be available to sign at all in any league uh they could really really set the tone and they could possibly i mean i know i'm setting the bar high but i'm just saying maybe there's a chance possibly they could be a top five scoring defense so you can you can get some win some games with them yeah you're absolutely right about that and uh I, look this was a trick question because that's what i was trying to get at <laughs> with uh the redskins defense going to be able to be one of those uh one of the 12 defenses that you're starting every week um they're good enough to be there um especially with adding chase young um to the helm so parker let's go to you who do you, now that you can't pick the redskins defense who do you <laughs> think is going to be a uh, could have a huge fantasy impact for people you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go where Mike Hall's staying. I, I'm going to stay in the running back room. I think Darius Geis, this is his year, man. You know, I, I feel like a lot of people are talking about the hypothetical situations of, you know, is Darius Geis going to be one of those running backs that gets cut, you know, early 2020 because of injury with a very, you know, loaded running back room. I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think we're going to see a lot of what we saw in Carolina. You know, that day he had 129 yards, two touchdowns, absolutely obliterated whoever was in front of him, showed a looseness, showed you that he was everything that you could thought he could be and more. I mean, it, most people would say, of course, Terry McLaurin. But, you know, I, I really feel like this is the year that Darius Geis really earns his keep and shows the Redskins that he was worth a second-day selection for sure. Right. Yeah. If he can stay healthy, especially, watch out, because Darius yeah. Geis, is show, he showed last year just how talented he is. Absolutely. And I, I feel like this year, you know, he didn't have he didn't have a, you know, horrible – history of injuries so i feel like it's been a lot of bad luck with him so i feel like this is year that it turns around man i really do and that's a great one because redskins fans are going to need it from the running back position um the the redskins organization as a whole really added some uh, some tools there to the running back room uh which speaks volumes to what they think the impact players are there now i was going to go running back but since you two of you already took that i'm gonna have to move because i thought jd mckissick could be the guy but I'm going to switch it up on you guys. I think it's Logan Thomas coming in, starting as a tight end, being able to go with him too in PPR formats. uh, Dwayne Haskins being a second year quarterback in a new system. He's going to need to depend on somebody and there's no other, there's no better person right now. I know Terry McLaurin, but Logan Thomas there at the tight end position being six, six being so big with a wide body frame. And we know with Dwayne Haskins at time, at times in medium and short range can be inaccurate um, with Logan Thomas. You don't have to worry about that as much. A dude is an athletic freak and he's very big with a wide uh, range. So he's going to be able to catch a lot of balls. I think he could be a very undercover tight end in PPR formats or fantasy. Right. Owners. No, I and, agree. And, Kyle. Yeah. What, one thing about Logan Thomas that isn't getting talked about enough is if you were to take his combine numbers, of course he was a quarterback, but in matches up against a tight end class this year, he would have been probably, probably considered the most athletic tight end he had mm-hmm. you know he ran a four six forty. he had a 38 inch vertical i believe i mean he just he had outstanding numbers for for a quarterback so you put that at tight end where he's a little bit bigger and he with his size it, it could be perfect there might be a reason that they haven't looked at acquiring any other tight yeah ends. i mean not only is it the raw athleticism but i was actually the uh detroit lions game last year when uh I'm he was starting too. in there the, oh, oh really god what a great game yeah well, um i was i was actually there he was crushing everyone that right. he was blocking I mean, not only is he a vertical threat, but, I mean, he dominates in the trenches as well, man. And, you know, like you said, man, just that raw athleticism. You know, I, I watched him play Virginia Tech as well, man. He's just an athlete, and he's going to go and get it. And I, I think he's got a lot of natural inst- instincts as well as a ball carrier that I feel like are very under talked right. about. Right. And being a former quarterback, he knows what quarterbacks like. So, yeah. so he's going to know how to find find the soft spot in the zone. He's, he's going to 
he should have good awareness and he's still learning the position. So if he can put it together on this team, watch out because he could actually be a very good fantasy sleeper. Yes. Um, and before, as we're wrapping this up here, one last thing I wanted to talk about. I'm not sure if you guys saw this come across Twitter today, but um, Sadiq Charles was interviewed. Keith Ishmael was interviewed. And they actually said they worked out together pre, uh, pre-draft. And they actually both got drafted to the Redskins, um, which is crazy enough. So they already have cohesion there. And then with Keith Ishmael, uh, I didn't know this. But I watched some of his uh, senior day tape. I'm not sure if you guys were able to see this. The dude dominated, like and did it and did it well too. And so, um, dude, when I interviewed Adam and Neba on here, he talked about how when he did a, a thread on Keith Ishmael, he had hit, uh, Keith Ishmael's teammates hitting him his DMs, telling him this dude is is very underrated. He is a baller. He is going to do well. And I told Adam and Neba, Adam and Neba at that time. I saw the same thing with Terry McLaurin the day after we drafted him. That's how I knew he was the best pick. If that is the case with, with Keith Fishmeal, I think that we just got our starting center or guard this season. And He's making the right. roster over Ross and Wes. Yeah. At least one right. of them. I would, right. I would imagine so. They just that versatility inside. And another interesting tidbit. So not only did Sadiq Charles and Keith Ishmael work out together, but Antonio Gibson and Cameron Curl were also working oh, out. Yep. So that's two that's two sets of players, four total players from our draft class that are familiar with each other from working out together. Yeah, I mean, go, go back to last year, you know, Kelvin Harmon and Dwayne Haskins are good friends. So, I mean, they, mm-hmm. they work out together a lot as well. So the, I guess cohesion is, is the theme. Right. And uh, Earl Thomas and his brother work out together the other night it's it's michael reed parker welcome welcome to the show <laughs> is that is that going to be the sound clip for this one i think it should be. yeah it's mine it's my sound clip <laughs> no, I'm def- definitely dude um it, well i appreciate everyone for stopping by today uh this certainly was a fun episode to say the least uh, Parker, I appreciate you coming on, sir. Uh, it was a blast. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you did you. an incredible job. Fun, man. Yeah, um, man. I, I'm a huge fan. Uh, we're actually recording our first episode of uh, Redskins Brawl tomorrow with uh, my buddy Chris Fowler and uh, former Redskins tight end Garrett Hudson. Really excited, really go. honored by the opportunity we got from the Brawl Network. So we're just ready to go. And hopefully this isn't the last time I'm on the Burgundy Zone because I had a blast as well, fellas. Oh, absolutely yeah, not, definitely Parker. Shouldn't absolutely be. not. Yeah, awesome. It won't be the last time. Well, I appreciate yeah, everyone for tuning in. I'm Kyle. I'm Mike Hall. And I am Black Mike. (laughs) (laughs) Every time. Every time. (laughs) Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you on Tuesday. We have another guest and a special announcement for you guys on Tuesday night. You're not going to want to miss it. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys soon. Redskins football. Woo! Woo!